Hello YouTube. Um, today I want to introduce you to hypothesis of the Russian investigators of the Dyatlov Pass tragedy. Two people who spent many years pursuing this case. I suggest to those who want to see my investigation uh, to look at the playlist Dyatlov Pass in my channel as I have different hypotheses uh, that I've collected and I present views of a number of Russian researchers. My own research began back in early 1990s, but I have Soviet references from earlier times when the case was not discussed and was basically a forbidden subject. But even the totalitarian state is not able to silence people, to cancel people, to silence, uh, to take away their right to think and speak and those who are emulating the Soviet way of silencing their opponents should remember it. Let's look at Yuri Yakimov hypothesis. World War II or the Great Patriotic War is as it was referred to in the USSR it ended in 1945. Well 13 plus years after the victory uh, it, in, after the victory in the war, in February of 1959, the Dyatlov tourist group, nine people, died in the northern Urals. It would seem that these two events are not connected in any way, uh, neither in time nor in terrain. But there is still a connection according to Yakimov. Now, let me explain something to you. In Russian, when would, would, tourists also refer to people who are actively exploring the environment, hikers, skiers, and so forth. So I use this word. It may mean different thing in English and other languages to, in a way, but we call them tourists. Well, <clears throat> first, <clears throat> the Yatlov group included frontline soldiers, soldier Simon Zolotaryov. He was fighting heroically in the war, according to Yakimov, and was awarded the Order of the Red Star. According to experience and qualifications, Zalataryov was uh, very close to being a master of sports in tourism. Okay? Again, the tourism in, the, in this context referred in the USSR to group hikes, nature exploration, sport-related active recreation, including skiing and water sports, not simple sightseeing and shopping in various locations. That's the Western equivalent. To obtain this title, Zolotaryov lacked an advanced ski trip of a high difficult category. That is, he had to do to accomplish a complicated ski trip. So, he ended up in this Dyatlov group. Again, this is uh, Yakimov's explanation. After the war, Zolotaryov graduated from the Institute of Physical Education in Belarus and successfully engaged in several sports. After graduating from this educational institution, he worked as a tourism instructor at campsites in Altai and the Sverdlovsk region. We can consider him a super tourist the most experienced and prepared participant of this hike. The other eight participants of the Dyatlov group were students and recent graduates of the Ural Polytechnic Institute. They already had experience of long distance hikes. Um, there were no weak ones among them. They can be defined as children of the war. Even in their school years, they learned all the difficulties of the very hard very difficult wartime period. They did not finish eating, they did not finish playing, did not celebrate. There was not enough resources. Their relatives died at the front. Since they were young, they tried uh, to help their parents and the country. Their childhood can hardly be called happy. The war has left its mark on their character, actions, and fate. Yakimov has been investigating this tragedy in the northern Urals for over 15 years. It is considered one of the greatest mysteries of the 20th century. Yakimov is straightforward. For him, there is no enigmas and mystery of the death uh, of the Dyatlov group 
all the actions and um, deeds of tourists or hikers on the pass are understandable and are logically explainable or explicable. In 2006, Yakimov put forward a report of the death of the Dyatlov group from the aggression or due to an aggression of an unidentified flying object, UFO. It did not come from nowhere. This account or report. On September 11, 2002, in the Ivdelsky district of the Sverdlovsk region, he witnessed an unusual incident. That's, that's the area of the Dyatlov Pass, not far. Okay, but we're speaking about the 2002. In the night forest, Yakimov suddenly observed a swaying light as from a powerful searchlight. The light source was behind the forest and its outlines and volume were not visible. He looked in the direction of this so-called light unit, which was approximately 0.5 kilometers away from Yakimov. It immediately reacted to Yakimov's gaze, turned its spotlight into the Russian researcher's direction and illuminated him with a strong light. He turned away from this light and could not understand what is it and from from where. It was quiet. Uh, there were no extra extraneous sounds or noises. Then the slide moved away from Yakimov in the other direction. He turned around and saw that some swaying lanterns were approaching him from the light source, as if several people with flashlights were running through the dark forest in Yakimov's direction. When he turned his gaze away, these objects did not approach him. As soon as Yakimov looked at them again, the swaying lanterns started moving in his direction. He caught his connection and realized uh, that you can't look at them. So he basically he understood the connection um, between the events. That you can't look at those lights, it's dangerous. Without looking back, Yakimov left this place. In the morning, the area where the light unit was located was examined, but there were no traces of its presence. Yakimov told his friends and co-workers about the event he observed, but few believed the researcher. They said, you imagined it. It, happened some, it happens sometimes when people imagine. And how can you prove that it wasn't imagined? There are no witnesses, no traces either. Two weeks later, Yakimov um, read a message in the local press that the same, same light phenomenon was seen at an overnight stay in the forest by somebody named Rutkovsky, who was the inspector of the nature reserve <coughs> Denishkin's uh, stone. This place is located in the neighboring Severo Uralsky district of the Sverdlovsk region. Yakima wanted to meet with the inspector and talk about this topic, but at that time he could not get to Rudkovsky and this meeting did not take place. And Yakimov didn't attach much importance to these events at that time. Well, three years have passed on. On TV, he saw a program about the Dyatlov Pass and thought maybe they also encountered this light phenomenon during the overnight stay on the pass and this was the reason for their death. He didn't know much about the tragedy of tourists on mountain Halat Sakal at that time. So Yakimov became interested in this and he seriously took up this topic. He found materials on the case of the death of tourists in libraries. He studied them. Yakimov found Inspector Rutkovsky and met with him. They talked at length and, uh, and, uh, and their testimonies mostly coincided. The inspector of the reserve was in the area um, of the operation of the light unit on August 29, 2002 from the beginning of its work to the end. At first he saw a glowing object in the sky about, this, about the size of two moons. Clouds were rapidly flying past this object. Then it was illuminated by a strong light as from a powerful searchlight. The light source was at an undetermined undet height. After a few minutes this light turned in the other direction. 
So after that, the swaying lanterns moved towards him through the forest according to his, uh, to his gaze. So he was gazing at them, he was looking at them. At first, Rutkowski was um, hiding with a gun behind a fallen tree, thinking, that's it, he's finished. Swaying lanterns sailed to him at a distance of 50 to 70 meters. Uh, Rutkowski caught, again, understood the connection between his gaze and the approach of the swaying lanterns to him. He turned away from them, lit a cigarette and gradually calmed calm down. Then he sat by the fire and tried not to look at the light. After four to four and a half hours, after the UFO began its operations, there was a clap like an electric discharge and the light went out. After that, uh, Rutkowski slept soundly by the fire, by the campfire for three or four hours. In the morning, he examined the location of the light objects, but found no traces. Yakimov recorded this story in detail uh, as an official act. So, what they saw in the night forest in the northern Urals at different times and at different places. Yakimov took this information attached to the materials of the investigation in the case of the Dyatlov group participants. And so this hypothesis was born in 2006. It was actually officially registered in the Yekaterinburg in the Dyatlov group memory foundation, published in the Ural magazine and in the local media. So over the past 15 years, new facts have emerged that confirm Yakimov's conclusions. He will not list all of them. The main thing of these facts is that the tourists themselves photographed this UFO. In 2010, in the regional um, foundation, of, in memory of the, uh, the memory of Dyatlov group in Yekaterinburg, these frames were found, discovered. The last of the pictures of the Dyatlov group the investigation in 1959 did not attach importance to them. They were thoroughly examined with modern equipment. It has been proven that these are not um, defective uh, shots or uh, yeah, photographs, you know, that is damaged during filming, but that the tourists or hikers deliberately took those pictures. Upon further examination of these photographic films, on the scanner it was found that the tourist with five cameras photographed this luminous object 31 times. Semyon Zolotaryov took 10 pictures in a row. Yakimov's hypothesis was confirmed by night phot photography of the Dyatlov group participants. These films are material evidence. The tourists themselves photographed their killer. The hypothesis confirmed by the fact becomes the truth according to Yakimov. For him there is no longer a mystery of Dyatlov's group's uh, demise or death of the participants. They accidentally encountered the UFO on the pass and this object showed aggression towards them. Later Yakimov was able to logically explain all the actions and deeds of the Dyatlov group before the death of the last of them. This tragedy can be divided into four stages. 1. Actions and deeds of tourists on the pass. 2. Evacuation of the wounded from the pass to the forest. 3. Fighting for the lives of the wounded comrades and for their lives in the cedar tree area. 4. The struggle for the life of the last survivors Zolotaryov and Kalivatov. All the actions of the Dyatlov group are explicable. The tourists saw a flying and glowing shining object from a kilometer high pass. They photographed it many times. After landing on the pass, the UFO showed aggression to three tourists. Tibor Brignol, Dubinina and Zolotaryov were seriously injured by a targeted shock wave. They received a high dose of radiation. Seeing this, the rest of the group did not abandon them and did not run down to the forest in a panic. They were rescuing their wounded comrades. 
the seriously wounded Thibault Brignol was unconscious and could not walk by himself. Six of the group took him in their arms and carried him from the pass down to the cedar tree. Two other people were also walking down, supporting each other. This is evidenced by the traces left by tourists. There were eight pairs of tracks and tourists, there were nine. There are testimonies of search engines, uh, sorry, testimonies of search groups about this in the materials of the official case. During the war, Soviet soldiers risked their lives to save the wounded, and the Dyatlov group did not abandon their friends injured at the pass and, they saved, and, and, and saved them. The journey to the forest took one to one and a half hours. In the Cedar Tree area, they dug a snow cave for them and sheltered Thibault Brignol, Dubinina, Kalevata, and Zolotaryov from the cold. The five tourists remaining on the surface climbed the uh, cedar uh, and conducted reconnaissance of the situation on the pass. There was a strong beam of light from the UFO. In order not to discover their location, the young people did not make a fire. Um, it, they, they, they left the area only when the UFO stopped shining the beam and flew away from the pass. Three young hikers went or moved toward the to, to the tent and two stayed by the fire. Why did they all freeze? The UFO before departure left on the ground some kind of hypnotic effect, hypnotic poisoning. From it all five fell asleep and then they froze. Rutkovsky and Yakimov um, had the same hypnotic effect on them in 2002 after encounter with UFOs. Doroshenko Krivonishenko froze at the campfire. It went out because no fire food was thrown into the fire. Doroshenko froze frothing at the mouth. It was formed from the effect of hypnotic poisoning on the body. Such a manifestation of poisoning with the release of foam does not occur in people and animals. The corpses of Dyatlov, Slobodin, Kalmogorova were found in dynamic poses by the search party. They were lying with their heads towards the tent. It was as if death had caught them attacking the enemy in the war. Those investigators of this tragedy who are seriously engaged in this topic have on the table, so to say, the, the case, uh, the volume, uh, uh, case of 1959, Volume 1, Volume 2. It is published as a separate book by the uh, Dyatlov Group Memory Foundation. It's a weighty edition. After studying it, Yakimov realized that the prosecutor criminologist Ivanov, who led the investigation of this tragedy, did his job well, professionally. Yakimov believes in the authenticity of these materials. But there was one document in this case volume, and he questioned the conclusions in it. Yakimov will explain it more in detail. At the beginning of May of 1959, the search party continued to search for the four Dyatlov group participants, Thibault Brignol, Dubinina, Kalivata, and Zolotaryov. In the Cedar, Cedar Tree area, under a thick layer of snow, they found a flooring made of poles trunks of 14 firs, fir trees, and one birch were laid out in a row. Branches of coniferous trees and cloth cut from um, uh, are laid on them. Doroshenko and Krivonishenko with a Finnish knife did it. Listen, we're speaking about very what should I say? I, I, I don't want to say in demand, but a knife that was very much in use in the Soviet Union uh, by a number of groups and uh, people. Uh, Finnish knife or Finca. It's a special type of knife. Um, I've seen it. Uh, I've seen people handle it. And uh, you don't forget when you see it. Anyway, the investigative materials indicate these trees were cut down and cleaned of branches with a Finnish knife by Krivonishenko. 
With the same knife, the clothes were cut off from two corpses. Yakimov happened to work in the northern Urals in the forest with an axe, felling small trees and clearing them of branches. The wood is hard, frozen in winter, pruning 14 fir trees and a birch with a finca of Finnish knife. Felling and clearing the trunks of these trees from branches is a lot of work. Even if it is done with an axe, you will sweat and the axe will become blunted. And in the conclusions of the examination, all the slices were made with a knife by Krivonichenko. This could not be happening. Yakimov questioned these conclusions of the investigation and he admits he was wrong. Years have passed. His doubts were dispelled when Yakimov found out detailed information about the so-called division of black knives. This is what the German soldiers and officers called the Ural Volunteer Tank Corp during the Great Patriotic War, World War II. It was formed in the Sverdlovsk region. It was staffed with volunteers from the Sverdlovsk, Chelyabinsk, Perm and Tumen regions. At the Zlata Ust tool factory, famous all over the world for its quality of steel, Finnish knives in black scabbards were made for the tank corps soldiers. All the crews of combat vehicles received such cold weapons. Yakimov will not retell the glorious path of the Ural tank troops, but it should be noted that this tank corps made a great contribution to the victory over the Nazi enemy. The desperate bravery of the Ural tank unit troops was noted even by the Nazis. If they knocked out a Soviet tank, then the crew shot back with pistols, ran out of ammunition, and then rushed them with finger knives. They rushed at the enemy. Soviet tank troops did not give up. They fought to the end. They won or died heroically in an unequal battle. That's what Yakimov says. And the enemies uh, highly appreciated this cold weapon. They understand how deadly it could be. Um, and if a Nazi could show such a finca as a war trophy, then they were presented uh, for an award just for having it, just for capturing it. The Germans were afraid of the Euro tank troops and called this military unit Division of Black Knives. And th this guy's fought, fought hard, you know. He's just, it was a horrible war. There were prisoners, there were Stalinist camps. There was much, a, a lot of, a lot of bloodshed. But these people, the Ural tank troops and others, they, they fought hard. And, uh, you know, we're not going to get into this, but I understand what, what Yakimov is saying. The Diatlov group had three Finca and Axis. They could protect themselves in the campaign from any evil people and animals. Krivonishenko had a Finnish knife in a black sheath on his belt, and he was very proud of it. To have such a masterpiece of Zlatowut uh, craftsman was great. How did this Finca get to him? Well, Yakimov has not been able to find out yet. Maybe someone from the frontline soldiers gave it to him, or maybe his parents bought this cold weapon somewhere and gave it to him. Um, Yakimov's doubts disappeared. The experts were right. Zolotaryov and Kalivatov could cut down 15 trees with this Finca knife made of steel, not inferior in quality to Damascus steel and they could clear those trees of branches. So why did the Dyatlov group participants do this? Yakimov cannot explain it in a nutshell. Well, on the morning of February 2nd, 1959, the last survivors, Zolotaryov and Kalivatov, got out from this snow hole, okay? Wh what do they see? The corpses of five frozen comrades, two at the extinguished campfire and three on the way to the tent. They conclude it is impossible to light a fire on the surface and it is impossible to crawl to the tents. They would die. So they decide to build a bear den, so to say, in which 
uh, one can escape from the cold. What kind of structure is this? Figuratively speaking, such a shelter can be called a dugout, um, a dugout in, in dense, deep snow. First, the flooring is constructed, poles are laid out in a row, pine needles put on them, they are covered with a tarpaulin and it is covered with snow. Remove the snow from under this flooring to the ground. It turns out a room with three walls of dense snow. Snow is removed to the ground and in front of this structure. A bonfire is built in front of the snow dugout and its heat is enough to warm up and spend the night in this room. In the winter of 1959, um, a tour group under Sergei Sogrin made a ski trip to the circumpolar Urals. Their tent burned down at night, but they found a way. They built such a snow dugout um, at night. Instead of poles, they stacked their skis in one row, and the branches of the twigs were covered with the rest of the tarpaulin from the burned tent. The last of the survivors, Zolotaryov and Kalevatov, well, with the Dyatlov Pass group, they tried to make the same structure. When instead of tarpaulin, they put cloth cut off by uh, this Finca knife from the corpses of Doroshenko and Krivonishenko. Zolotaryov and Kalevatov were traumatized and did this work overcoming excruciating pain and cold. They were exhausted and could not finish the job. They climbed back into the snow hole to their former place to warm up with their breath, rest and gain strength. They stayed there until the end. Already freezing next to the deceased Tivo Brignol and Dubinina, Zolotaryov tried to write in a notebook the last words about the encounter with an unknown object, but he didn't have time. All nine tourists were killed. Could Dyatlov's group have survived after a this encounter with the UFO and the pass? Yes, they could, according to Yakimov. If only the tourists knew how to behave in this situation. They didn't know and could not know that this object, which works or operates silently and doesn't cause fear in the first minutes, that it doesn't react to fire and the voice. It reacts only to the person's gaze and liquidates people with a purposeful shock wave of in its work area, where they happen to be in this area of operation. That's how it is programmed. Now we know that. Doesn't that happen? Numerous facts prove the unprecedented that unprecedented phenomena happens on our planet. The Atlov group are heroes who died in reconnaissance, so to say. This also makes them related to the fallen heroes of the Second World War. They did not abandon their wounded comrades at the pass and fought for their lives and their own lives to the end. They left us an invaluable 31 frames depicting a flying object of a round shape, a UFO. The information of the 1959 investigation about this unusual tragedy is also very important. Injuries of tourists from a targeted shock wave, radiation on their clothes, at the same time, there were no traces of shock waves and radiation on the pass itself and at the cedar tree. Well, for some reason, uh, the official authorities did not realize the importance of such facts. Yakimov provided them with this information and they had in their hands the films of the Dyatlov uh, uh, group participants who denied shoot of the object. Yakimov says, time will pass, this invaluable information will someday interest mankind and people will appreciate the accomplishment of the Dyatlov group. Okay, now let's move on to another interesting piece of investigation. This is by Alexei Karalev, a researcher, um, also investigator of this tragedy. Um, he says, by and large, the whole tragedy of the Dyatlov Pass, discussed for decades by millions of people, lies in the palm of your hand. 
We just need to have the courage to admit to ourselves there is something more strange and unknown around us than falling faulty rockets, raging criminals, ruthless military, and avalanches descending from the slopes. And you also have to believe that people are telling you the truth. Stop considering yourself uh, the, o the only truth teller in our not so honest world, of course. The truth was told to us long ago. And here, uh, speaking about investigator Ivanov, Lev Nik Nikitich Ivanov was a highly high official in the powerful repressive structure of the Soviet state um, for 60 70 years. After, you know, after all, from 1962, he was the prosecutor of the region. And of course, he was unable to give the public more information about the death of the tourists than was allowed by the highest Soviet authorities. However, by the end of the 1980s, the secrecy in the Soviet Union was ending. Everything was handed over. Uh, the missile defense system, the Metro 2 secrets, chemical plants with nuclear weapons, mobile and railway complexes. Some were dismantled, some were stolen, and all the documentation was handed over uh, to the f Western so-called friends, so he says it. In some cases, as the former Yeltsin minister Polteranian writes, for example, documents of the most com com complex and expensive objects were sold for even the already <laughs> un funny ones, you know, less than funny sums of $10,000. And after all this, are there people among the Dyatlov past tragedy investigators who sincerely believe that this story is a secret so important to the Russian state that after 60 plus years it continues to be sacredly kept hidden? And he says, people, come to your senses. There is not a single Soviet secret that has not been revealed for sincere or commercial uh, reasons. And any topic that was hidden in the USSR was later found out by many researchers and documents and witnesses. And he lists such nuclear disasters, space exploration failures, disasters, gulag concentration camps, falsified trials and repressions, migrations of people, Stalin sent whole populations to wilderness areas and so forth. But now, time after time and year after year, there are many people who claim that everything was sold, but what happened at the Dyatlov Pass was not sold. Oh, uh, to the West and, uh, you know, uh, as disclosure for money. That is, as a matter of fact, this is the main Soviet secret. So that's how it turns out. It doesn't work. If it's a rocket, then it was outdated back then, 60 years ago. There is nothing to keep, you know? Yet, if it is represent some phenomenally great value for the Soviet state, then after all, if it still fell down, it meant that the rocket was imperfect. And after this incident, the Dyatlov Pass, if a rocket fell down, it would have been brought up many more times and for many years. So the final device that would, would be made would be completely different. And again, he says, investigator Ivanov revealed almost everything or told almost everything. So, Lev Nikitich Ivanov, in the era of chaos, he realized that he could now return to those events. But having spent his whole life in law enforcement agencies, he began with the frontline service. And then, since 1945, the prosecutor's office, then he went higher and higher. Well, he certainly understood that caution is above all. Now, there is democracy and transparency, but tomorrow the former government and order may return, which, by the way, was partly confirmed by the um, Soviet coup of August 1991, when they tried to bring back the Soviet Union and failed. Surely Ivanov, 
then thought at least for a minute that he should not have started to open up and then um, he thinks he's glad that he didn't say it much and what exactly did he say well let's remember in an article that he published in the newspaper of the Kostanai region Leninsky way and elo el eloquently called the mystery of the fireballs he directly calls this most mysterious uh, spheres or balls the culprit of the in the death of the tourists at the same time he absolutely does not give any hints about missile activity and, def and Soviet defense issues on the contrary he insists um, on their mystery of the fireballs and offers to study them and only the study of the fireballs is able according to Ivanov to finally give a clue as to what happened to the Dyatlov group. At the same time, Lev Ivanov says amazing words that supporters of the rocket accident or flight over the secret uh, rocket over the pass that they like to ignore. Namely, he said, only those who were in this ball, uh, balloons, they call them spheres, know more about everything that happened than me. Okay? Now a question for the respected experts. At the beginning of 1959, Yuri Alexeyevich Gagarin, first Soviet cosmonaut, is still two, two plus years away from the first manned flight in a rocket. Let's take the trouble to explain what kind of pilots cosmonauts flew over the northern Urals. Those who have logic and knowledge of the realities of the history of the space exploration will immediately say, of course, none, none of the cosmonauts. There were and could not be uh, people in rockets of any class who would have reason, or f I would say uh, ascended uh, or upwards, flew into the space. On February 1st, 2nd, 1959, from any spaceports and any launch pad in the world. This means that there could not be such a thing near the Dyatlov Pass group, any such rocket. Ivanov said this almost openly in plain text, and for a reason, he clearly did not want to get into the sensitive topic of UFOs. Well, the same caution of a seasoned prosecutor. Besides, he worked as a lawyer until his death in 1997, which means that in order to succeed with clients, you cannot be mixed up in such matters. Okay? Uh, so this is what he wants to say, that um, Ivanov was cautious, but he could also hide the truth. Um, but the hints are absolutely clear. Okay, that's what he says, that uh, oh, he, he, uh, Ivanov relied on hints. You just have to have the courage to admit it. Lev Nikitich Ivanov, who worked in the prosecutor's office for nearly 30 years and experienced a lot of pressure from the highest state and party uh, bodies, had enough courage to at least admit it. Which means to him, the culprits were those mysterious UFOs. Okay, so I gave you some more hypothesis. I will uh, come back to this case and tell you more developments uh, from the uh, recent Russian investigations because it is in Russia probably the most mysterious case. In my opinion, after the Tunguska phenomena, it's the second most mysterious and misunderstood and inexplicable case. But maybe someday we'll find out more about it. Thank you for your support. Please uh, uh, help me uh, with my research. You can see the links in the description to this video. Please subscribe to my channel and tell others.